The Borrowers Aloft, Chapter 23 The door of Vine Cottage was unlocked, and Pod pushed it open. A fire was burning in an unfamiliar grate, and Spiller lay asleep on the floor. As Pod entered, he scrambled to his feet. They stared at each other. Spiller's pointed face looked tired and his eyes a little sunken. Pod smiled slowly. Hello, he said. Hello, said Spiller, and without any change of expression, he stopped and picked some nutshells from the floor and threw them on the fire. It was a new floor, Pod noticed, of honey-colored wood with a woven mat beside the fireplace. Been away quite a while, remarked Spiller casually, staring at the blaze. The changed fireplace, Pod noticed, now incorporated a small iron cooking stove. Yes, he said, looking about the room. We've been all winter in an attic. Spiller nodded. You know, said Pod, a room at the top of a human house? Spiller nodded again and kicked a piece of fallen nutshell back into the grate. It flared up brightly with a cheerful crackle. We couldn't get out, said Pod. Ah, said Spiller noncommittally. So we made a balloon, went on Pod, and we sailed it out of the window. Spiller looked up sharply, suddenly alert. Arietti and Homily are in it now. It's caught on the wire fence. Spiller's puzzled glance darted toward the window and it swiftly darted away again. The fence was not visible from here. Some kind of boat, he said at last. In a manner of speaking, Pod smiled. Care to see it? He added carelessly. Something flashed in Spiller's face a spark that was swiftly quenched. Might as well, he conceded. May I interest you, said Pod, a note of pride in his voice. He glanced once more about the room. They've done the house up, he remarked. Spiller nodded. Running water and all. Running water, exclaimed Pod. That's right, said Spiller, edging toward the door. Pod stared at the piping above the sink, but he made no move to inspect it. Tables and floor were strewn with Spiller's borrowings. Sparrow's eggs and nut egg shells, nuts, grains, and laid out on a dandelion leaf, six rather shriveled, smoked minnows. Been staying here, he said. On and off, said Spiller, teetering on the threshold. Again, Pod's eyes traveled about the room. The general style of it emerged, in spite of Spiller's clutter. Plain chairs, scrubbable tables wooden dressers, painted plates, hand-woven rug, all very Rossetti-ish and practical. Smells of humans, he remarked. Does a bit, agreed Spiller. We might just tidy round, Pod suggested. Wouldn't take us a minute. As though an apology, he added, it's first impressions with her, if you get my meaning. Always has been, and he broke off abruptly as a sharp sound split the silence. What's that? said Spiller, as I met startled eye. It's the balloon, cried Pod, and suddenly, white-faced, he stared in a stunned way at the window. They've burst it, he exclaimed, and pushing past Spiller, he dashed out through the door. Homily and Arietti were shaken but unharmed, were clinging to the wire. The basket dangled emptily, and the envelope in tatters seemed threaded onto the fence. The net now looked like a bird's nest. We got it down lovely, Pod heard Homily gasping, as hand over hand, he and Spiller climbed up the mesh of the fence. Stay where you are, Pod called out. Came down like a dream, Pod, Homily kept on crying. Came down like a bird. All right, called Pod. Just you stay quiet where you are. Then the wind changed, persisted Homily, half sobbing, but still at the top of her voice and swung us around sideways against that jagged wire. But she came down lovely, Pod, light as a thistle down, didn't she, Arietti? But Arietti, too proud to be rescued, was well on her way to the ground. Spiller climbed swiftly toward her, and they met in a circle of mesh. You're on the wrong side, said Spiller. I know, I can soon climb through. There were tears in her eyes. Her cheeks were crimson and her hair blew about in wisps. 
Like a hand, said Spiller. No, thank you. I'm quite all right. And avoiding his curious gaze, she hurriedly went on down. How stupid, how stupid, she exclaimed aloud when she felt herself out of earshot. She was almost in tears. It should never have been like this. He would never understand the balloon without having seen it inflated, and mere words could never make clear all that they had gone through to make it and the extent of their dizzy success. There was nothing to show for this now but a stained old strawberry basket, some shreds of shriveled rubber, and a tangled branch of string. A few moments earlier, she and her mother had been bringing it down so beautifully. After the first flurry of panic, Homily had had one of her sudden calms. Perhaps it was the realization of being home again. The sight of their unchanged village at peace in the afternoon light and the filament of smoke that rose up unexpectedly from the chimney of Vine College, a drifting pennant of welcome that showed the house was inhabited and that the fire had only just been lit. Not lit by Miss Menzies, who had long since passed out of sight, nor Pod, who had not yet reached the house. So they guessed it must be Spiller. They had suddenly felt among friends again, and proud of their great achievement, they had longed to show off their prowess. In a business-like manner, they had coiled up the ropes, stacked the tackle, and made the basket ship-shape. They had wrung out their wet clothes, and homily had redone her hair. Then methodically and calmly, they had set to work following Pod's instructions. It's too bad, Arietta exclaimed, looking upward as she reached the last rung of the wire. There was her father helping Homily with footholds, and Spiller, of course, at the top of the fence, busily examining the wreckage. Very dispirited, she stepped off the wire, drew down a plantain leaf by its tip, and flinging herself along its springy length, she lay there glumly, staring upward, her hands behind her head. Homily, too, seemed very upset when, steered by Pod, she eventually reached the ground. It was nothing we did, she kept saying. It was just a change of the wind. I know, I know, he consoled her. Forget it now. It's served its purpose, and there's a surprise for you up at the house. You and Arietti go on ahead while Spiller and I do the salvage. When Homily saw the house, she became a different woman. It was as though, thought Arietti, watching her mother's expression, Homily had walked into a paradise. There were a few stunned moments of quiet, incredulous joy before excitement broke loose, and she ran like a mad thing from room to room, exploring, touching, adjusting, and endlessly exclaiming, They've divided the upstairs into two, and there's a little room for you, Arietti. Look at this sink. I ask you, Arietti. Water in the tap and all. And what's that thing on the ceiling? It's a bulb from a flashlight of some kind, said Arietti, after a moment's study. And beside the back door, in a kind of lean-to shed, they found the great square battery. So we've got electric light, breathed Homily, slowly backing away. Better not touch it, she went on in an awestruck and frightened voice, until your father comes. Now help me clear up Spiller's clobber, she went on excitedly. I pity any unfortunate creature who ever keeps house for him but her eyes were alight and shining. She hung up her new dress beside the fire to dry and delighted to find them again, she changed into her old clothes. Arietti, who for some reason still felt dispirited, found she had grown out of hers. I look ridiculous in this, she said unhappily, trying to pull down her sweater. Well, who's to see you, Homily retorted, except your father and Spiller. Panting and straining, she worked away, clearing and stacking and altering the positions of the furniture. Soon, nothing was where it had been originally, and the room looked rather odd. You can't do much with a kitchen living room, Homily remarked, when, panting a little, she surveyed the results. I'm still not sure about that dresser. What about it, said Arietti, who was longing to sit down. That it wouldn't be better where it was. Can't we leave the men to do it, said Arietti. They'll be back soon for supper. That's just the point, said Homily. If we move it at all, we must do it now, before I start on the cooking. It looks dreadful there, she went on crossly. Spoils the whole look of the room. Now come on, Arietti. It won't take us a minute. 
With the dresser back in its old position, the other things looked out of place. Now that table could go here, Homily suggested. If we move this chest of drawers, you take one end, Arietti. There were several more reshuffles before she seemed content. A lot of trouble, she admitted happily as she surveyed the final result. But worth it in the end. It looks a lot better now, doesn't it, Arietti? It suddenly looks kind of right. Yes, said Arietti dryly, because everything's back where it was. What do you mean? exclaimed Homily. Where it was before we started, said Arietti. Nonsense, snapped Homily crossly. But she looked about her uncertainly. Why, that stool was under the window. But we can't waste time arguing now. Those men will be back any moment, and I haven't started the soup. Run down to the stream now. There's a good girl, and get me a few leaves of watercress. <laughs> well, thanks so much for listening. We'll go on with chapter 24 in the next video. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear what you think of the book. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.